Hello, everyone, and welcome to phalloseminar.org. Today's theme is the novel coronavirus, and we're going to have three talks in that topic. We've had one, so this is the second talk. Uh, please use the YouTube live comment box to ask questions or tweet at Philo Seminar. Today's speaker is Philippe LeMay. Philippe got his master's in pharmaceutical sciences, then a master's in bioinformatics, then his PhD in medical sciences, all at the University of Leuven, where he is now faculty. I'm sure that many of you are familiar with this work as he's one of the true thought leaders in using phylogeny to inform infectious disease control. He has now has 362 publications. Uh, actually, that was a few weeks ago, so maybe there's more, including many this year that have been the definitive work on SARS-CoV-2 and its spread. And this is a special file seminar because it's the 100th file seminar. I actually had to like go do some things to add an extra leading zero so we didn't get sorting errors. Uh, but that's very exciting, and I can't think of anyone better to uh, have give our 100th seminar. So thank you, Philippe, and thank you for participating. Wow, thanks, uh, Eric. Uh, it's uh, it's an honor to do the 100th seminar. Um, actually, I did one 10 years ago, so it's good to be back. Um, and looking back, I think you were really visionary with organizing online seminars. So thanks for bringing these to the, to the community. So I'll present some work that we have been doing on, on the origin and early spread of SARS-CoV-2. And I already would like to point out that all of the work that I will be presenting uh, results from various collaborations. Um, and these are some of the key people involved. So from left to right, we have uh, Mark Suchard and Andrew Rambeau, both uh, senior developers of the Peace software, which will be a, um, a strong focus of, of what I will be presenting. Uh, we have Maciek Boni, Mike Warby, uh, David Robertson, and Martha Nelson, who also contributed some slides uh, to this presentation. So this is a non-exhaustive list, uh, and I'll have a full acknowledgement at the end of my talk. So let me uh, start with a slide from Emma Holtcroft, who gave a, a fantastic follow seminar about two weeks ago. So for those who missed it, um, I would really recommend to go and check it out on the YouTube channel. So Emma used this timeline to, uh, to, to list some early events in the COVID pandemic and then the genomic response to the, to the pandemic. And I'm going to squeeze in another item here uh, which was where the time at which uh, Andrew Rambeau created a section on virological.org, which is a platform for early discussion and, and preliminary analysis uh, in the field. So for phylogeneticists working on vir viruses, this is always an important sign that there is or there will be work to, to be done. And indeed, two days later, uh, the first uh, genome was posted on, on this section of virological.org. I mean, I'm also going to use the opportunity to point out that Andrew is also leading the Arctic network, uh, which has played an important role in the genomic response. And this is thanks to teams uh, from, of Nick Lohman and Josh Quick uh, within the Arctic consortium who designed popular sequencing protocols. So th I thought it was important to, to acknowledge this. So I personally got involved in SARS-CoV-2 work through discussions on, on that platform, uh, following a post by David Robertson from the University of Glasgow. And he started to analyze the evolutionary history of SARS-CoV-2 in, in, in more detail. And it was already very clear from the beginning that there is a lot of recombination in SARS-CoV related coronaviruses in bats. And this has been suggested by others, but we were not very convinced about claims that uh, SARS-CoV-2 itself was uh, a recombinant uh, virus. So this is traditionally a challenge, I would say, in, in recombination analysis. It's not so hard to demonstrate that there is phylogenetic incongruence in viral sequence data. It's more challenging to disentangle the, the full recombination structure, including all the recombination breakpoints. And it can be particularly hard to discriminate the actual recombinants from their parental strains or descendants from the parental strains. 
in particular when there is uh, incomplete sampling. So we started uh, looking into this um, as an ad hoc collaboration, uh, including also Andrew Rambo and Maciek Boni. Maciek here is the developer of 3Sec, which is a, a heuristic approach that we use to study the, the recombination patterns. And when you do the exercise, uh, it turns out that although there is a significant recombination, and on top you can see here the, the breakpoint uh, distribution across the genomes, there are also a, a number of non-recombinant blocks here, which is, is of course very useful um, because it means that we can apply phylogenetic inference. Now, in terms of, of the origin of SARS-CoV-2, it's interesting to zoom into the spike gene, which is important for uh, cell entry. And it's variable loop specifically, which is crucial for the receptor binding. Now, in the spike gene here, we see that uh, across the gene, SARS-CoV-2 is most closely related to this green uh, bat virus here, the RATG13. And this is also the case across basically the whole genome. However, in the variable loop, um, SARS-CoV-2 is most closely related to a virus from a pangolin. So at first sight, that seems to suggest that SARS-CoV-2 is a recombinant of uh, a bat virus and this pangolin virus. However, um, on closer ins inspection, across the, the spike gene, this pangolin genome remains roughly equally divergent from SARS-CoV-2 here, the orange bar. But it's the RAT, sorry, it's the RAT uh, G13 that is particularly divergent in the variable loop. So this essentially shows that it's this bat virus that is the recombinant, and it, it acquired a different receptor combination through uh, um, recombination with an as yet unsampled bat. So according to this, the, the crucial receptor binding uh, domain residues here uh, are shared by at least these three viruses. So that means that there's probably other viruses out there uh, that have the same uh, receptor affinity for human uh, ACE2. So the next question is, uh, how long have these viruses been circulating? Now for that, uh, we can apply molecular clock analysis and our uh, Bayesian diversion, uh, divergence dating using BEAST. Uh, and we can apply this on these non-recombinant uh, parts of the genome. There are some interesting time-dependent rate dynamics here in coronaviruses. So we see faster rates if you sample over shorter time frames. So I wouldn't go over interpreting these deeper nodes here, but we are interested in some of the shallow nodes. For example, when the SARS-CoV-2 virus finds its common ancestor with this uh, bat RAT13 virus. And for that, we need to go back about 40 to 70 years ago. So both uh, this divergence time estimate and the location of sampling, um, this bat has been sampled in Yunnan. And we know, of course, that SARS-CoV-2 emerged in, in Hubei. Um, basically indicate uh, big surveillance gaps, uh, both in bats, uh, but also in other mammalian hosts for that matter. So far, no uh, intermediate host has been identified, uh, whereas this was the case for uh, the original SARS-CoV-1 -CoV and the MERS virus. And the question is whether there was or whether there is actually an in, uh, intermediate uh, host. Um, this was probably not needed to for the adaptation to humans, 
but it could of course have led to, to more exposure to humans. I have to point out that there is now also another bat virus genome, the RMYN02 virus from Yunnan, uh, which has particular parts of its genome close, more closely related to SARS-CoV-2, but not in the receptor binding domain. So it does not really change uh, the picture that I presented. Okay, I'm, I'm going to use my remaining time to present work on the molecular epidemiology of the of the human pandemic. And as Emma uh, had pointed out, there is a fantastic genomic resource available uh, nowadays to do so. We've passed the 200K submission in GIS8, which is the result of enormous sequencing efforts on a scale that we haven't seen before. And Emma also demonstrated what you can do uh, with this wealth of data using NextStream, um, with questions ranging from worldwide spread to local epidemics. Um, so basically the when and where of virus transmission and how particular mutations are spreading. However, uh, there are also some uh, challenges and an important one is that there is fairly low genetic diversity on the small time scale that we're studying it. Um, as Emma pointed out, uh, we expect to see about two substitutions per month, um, two, but with a lot of noise uh, in the relationship between, between time and divergence accumulation. So the genomic data uh, will be of limited use uh, if you try to reconstruct transmission in detail, if only a few mutations or thrown into the genomes over the course of a transmission chain. So a reconstructed phylogeny that ideally we would like to uh, look like this for this sample of this transmission chain will probably uh, look more like something like this here, which is uh, poorly resolved. And if there are only few mutations to distinguish the genomes, um, Sequencing errors, of course, will also pose a serious problem. And finally, um, if you're going to focus on more large scale spatial transmission dynamics, we also need to confront the tremendous uh, spatial temporal uh, sampling bias in the genome data. Um, all, most of the global sequencing eff effort has been led by, by Europe, as you can see here. Um, and most of the data is actually coming out of the UK. So if you would do the naive reconstruction of all the data, it would basically look like the virus is uh, spreading from, from the UK. So in this situation, um, I think it's useful to, to uh, have a look at what Bayesian phylodynamic inference can do, uh, not just because uh, it allows us to average over all plausible trees and as such accommodate the uncertainty uh, associated with our uh, low resolution estimates, but also because it allows to integrate various sources of information. Um, and as such, it can provide more resolution uh, to our estimates. So sampling time will help shape the follow dynamic estimate. Uh, provided that there is reasonable signal for divergence accumulation over the short time, as suggested by, by this graph. And a tree estimated under a clock model can, of course, be different than a tree estimated under a non-clock model. Also, spatial data, even modeled with a very simple process, like a continuous time Markov chain model, uh, can contribute to the reconstruction in our joint inference. And this will be particularly the case if the sequence data offers low re resolution. The question, of course, is whether this is a good thing, um, specifically if the sampling is biased, because we know that these reconstructions are very prone to sampling bias. And I will, I will return to this issue. 
We've also shown that you can make the parameters of this simple CTMC a function of uh, a number of predictors, such as air transportation data, as illustrated here. So this is another way of incorporating relevant information in the final dynamic estimates. And that actually could offer some protection uh, against sampling bias for these spatial models. So I'm going to focus on two studies that involve the, the BEAST framework, um, and they've been published somewhat in the wrong order, but that's probably not surprising in the vortex of COVID-19 publications. So on the right here, um, the, this is a, a more of a methods paper, and on the left uh, is a more of a molecular epidemiological study uh, that uses some of the machinery that we presented in this methods paper. So as part of this uh, methodological paper, uh, we extend our framework to be able to include individual travel history in these reconstructions. And we thought it was important to do so because a significant number of the early genomes were actually uh, sampled from patients that just returned from travel to other locations. Uh, many actually coming back from uh, Hubei. Now in this case, uh, we can incorporate this information basically by introducing additional ancestral nodes in our random phylogeny that are associated with this uh, travel location. And we introduce them at time ti to j, which we set to the return time of traveling, if we have that available. So this basically specified that the most recent, uh, so it specifies the most recent time at which the virus was still observed in the travel location before being sampled at the return location. And this can have an important effect on the reconstructions um, because in this case, we see that um, the reconstruction has a relative poor uh, representation of Hubei. And here, Australia is actually a source for Italy which is of course at odds with uh, epidemiology. So by injecting that travel history information, the reconstruction now has a, a very clear uh, Hubei backbone. Australia is now a sink instead of a source. Uh, we also see transitions between otherwise uh, unsampled locations. Also, as part of this work, uh, we demonstrated how to integrate out uh, unobserved lineages from particular locations. So this can be important for locations for which, according to epi information, you, you know that there should be many circulating viruses, but they are simply not represented or not well represented in our sample. So in this case, we can introduce taxa associated with these locations and with the probabilistic sampling time distribution. So this will provide us with a way of checking how robust the reconstructions are with respect to particular sampling biases. So let me explain the intuition behind this using a small uh, Zika virus data set. So for Zika, we know that French Polynesia here um, was basically the stepping stone for spread from Asia to other South Pacific islands, and also for the introduction in Brazil in 2014. Uh, we know this based, uh, based on standard epi data, but also uh, from the genomic analysis. And here, a small data set of 56 genomes and 20 countries basically shows that the, the sequences from, from French Polynesia or clustering at the base of this um, South Pacific Americas cluster here. Now, if you treat these taxa as having unobserved genomes, so you basically encode them by ends, and you parameterize the diffusion model according to air travel, and you integrate out their sampling time over a distribution 
that represents the epidemic curve of French Polynesia, then this is the reconstruction that we're getting. So note that I'm not showing uh, the French Polynesian genomes here. Um, of course, they're highly volatile. So showing a single tree with them is, is, is pretty much meaningless. So what we do here is uh, prune them out, but we look at the impact uh, on the state reconstructions at the nodes. And in green here, you see the state as, uh, assignment for French Polynesia. So basically showing that this recovers this stepping stone role uh, with an introduction into the Americas and other South Pacific islands. Although not with the same support as the original data, of course. I, I'm sorry, I, did, I didn't quite follow that. So, so you, you take them out entirely or? So we basically, so what we do is replace their genomes with ends, basically, right? So they have unobserved sequences. We do the inference and then from the posterior trees, I prune them because they're highly volatile and just showing a single tree doesn't really represent their overall cross-trip. But, but what, why replace their genomes? With the, why not just, I don't know, if leave one in or something? I think I'm just missing, I'm missing a big part of the picture here. Now, what I'm trying to do is, you know, just um, by, by removing them, uh, basically I'm mimicking the, the ID that we don't have data from French Polynesia. Okay, this is, I see. So this is a sort of an experiment that you're yeah, like, absolutely. If we, okay, right. So you're saying when we have the full genome data that tells us, that gives us a good picture that shows that French Polynesia is the introduction, is there how it got there? But even if we didn't, and we just imagined that we had some unsampled lineages that had, yeah. Okay, I, I think I understand that. Exactly. So this is just a, an intuitive example uh, showing that if we don't actually have the sequence data, um, but we have some epi data that characterizes their potential sampling time, and we in inject some information about plausible uh, uh, transition rates between the location, we're still able to recover that, that uh, transition through French Polynesia. And presumably, if you had one sequence and then that in, then you would do even better. You do even better, and you actually get the, the same support as the original data. Perfect. Okay, thanks. But I thought without sequence data, this is kind of the worst case scenario. So let's see what we <laughs> get from this. All right, cool, thanks. All right. Okay, so um, we apply this to a data set that was available um, on March uh, 10th this year. So at that time, we only had about 300 g genomes available, um, 60 of which were associated with travel history. Um, and I'm very indebted here to, to Verity Hill from Andrew's group, who collected most of this information, mainly from media reports, and then had to match it to the genomic data because unfortunately this is uh, not standard metadata that is available. So the beast, here, beast tree here is colored according to continent, except for China, uh, but we considered individual locations uh, in the analysis. So individual uh, countries, sorry, and Chinese provinces. So in total 44 um, locations. And we used a GLM formulation of the discrete diffusion uh, model, considering within continent geographic distances, again, global air travel, and also an estimable asymmetry coefficient for transitions in and out Hubei, because we expect this early uh, dynamics to be mainly dominated by a flux out of Hubei. And this is not covered by these symmetric predictors here. Now the estimates here are, are both for using only sampling location and using travel history or, cor or, cor or color, sorry, according to the magnitude of the effect. So what we see is a somewhat stronger um, asymmetry effect for the travel history. And that's because most of our 
Uh, genomes with travel history are from patients returning from Hubei. And in both cases, uh, air travel is important as well, um, whereas geographic distance isn't. So a reviewer also asked us to do this exercise with uh, using sampling sizes as predictors. And interestingly, uh, we see a large effect of sample sizes at the origin location when using only sampling location. Um, whereas uh, this is not the case when we use travel history. We still see um, a big effect of destination sampling size, but I think if I think that is okay if you include a lot of uh, samples from a particular location, you probably need to invoke more transitions to that location, as long as these locations are not incorrectly inferred as sources uh, because of their uh, large sample sizes. And that's essentially what we're seeing here with the origin sampling size predictor being included when using only sampling location. So basically what this suggests is that travel history in this case uh, already corrects to some extent for sampling bias. Now we did also uh, a more formal assessment of the performance of this travel aware reconstruction using a posterior predictive accuracy assessment. So here we did a tenfold cross validation, each time uh, holding out 10% of the travel data. And then we evaluate how well we can estimate the location of the withheld travel data. And we evaluate the accuracy um, of the predictions using the multi-category uh, Breer score. And this Breer score ranges from zero for perfect accuracy uh, to two for perfect inaccuracy. So what we see if we include most of the travel history data um, is that we get a much lower Breer score, uh, which means in this case, almost a twofold improvement in accuracy. So clearly demonstrating the advantages of including travel history. In some of these analysis, uh, we've also included uh, these unsampled uh, taxa and to decide uh, for which locations we, we needed to augment the sampling with unsampled taxa, we basically looked at the ratio of genomes to case counts. And we set this ratio to an arbitrarily, an arbitrary lower boundary for which, for which this must be met by adding these additional unsampled uh, taxa if needed. And our choice of this lower boundary led us to have uh, to, to include these unsampled taxa for 14 locations in this case, um, and mostly actually for Hubei, for which we had um, a low number of samples relative to the case counts. So we actually had to add uh, almost twice the amount of uh, unsampled taxa relative to the genomes that, that we have. And we integrate their sampling times over prior distributions uh, with a shape that reflects the estimates of prevalent infections through time. And this was done based on some modeling from Nate Gruba's uh, uh, team. Now, a challenging aspect, I think, of these infer inferences is how to summarize the results um, and evaluate particular scenarios, uh, in particular because the estimates are associated with a lot of uncertainty. And this is indicated here by the posterior node support histogram for the full reconstruction. So there's only a few nodes that are um, that receive uh, good support in this uh, reconstruction so for the for this purpose uh, we propose to use what we call trajectory plots um, that basically summarize the spatial ancestry of a particular taxon while averaging over all posterior trees so in a single tree here uh, we can track the ancestry 
and the discrete space transitions in the history of that uh, particular taxon, in this case, uh, a Swiss taxon, in the B1 lineage, which is essentially the, the lineage um, that represents the D614G variant. So this is what we can summarize for one tree. And of course, we can average this over all uh, posterior trees. And then we get, we get um, a plot that looks like this, where you see sort of the main transitions for this particular taxon. And what we see in this case is that the Swiss, the Swiss taxon uh, first finds its ancestry in the Netherlands before uh, tracing back to, to Germany. And after that, it really becomes uh, uncertain. If you look at the same taxon in the travel aware reconstruction, we see that the picture is quite different. So in this case, the Swiss taxon finds its ancestry in Italy instead of the Netherlands. And the reason here is because, because we don't really have uh, many genomes from Italy. We actually only have two genomes in this particular sample. But we do have five genomes from travelers returning from Italy. For example, the, the Brazilian one and the Mexican and the Nigerian one here are all travelers returning from Italy. So if we uh, include that information, this, we basically flip from the Netherlands, which is um, represented by most of the sequence data, to an ancestry in Italy. This is further reinforced uh, by adding unsampled taxa. Uh, and these are the dotted uh, lines here uh, that basically contribute to this Italian cluster. Uh, and they also actually contribute to a direct ancestry in Hubei. This is another example, uh, this time for the, the B4 lineage. Uh, in this lineage, we have a number of samples from Australia, uh, but many of them uh, are actually from travelers that return from Iran. And we do not have any direct samples from Iran so in this analysis. So obviously, we only recovered this Iranian ancestry with the travel aware analysis. And if you look at the analysis that includes the ensemble taxa, we see that the ones uh, we add for Iran here with dotted lines, um, they form a cluster that basically embeds those genomes from the returning travelers. So again, these ensemble taxa basically reinforce the Iranian uh, ancestry in this case. So these were specific uh, details from the reconstruction. We can also look at uh, the overall uh, phylogeographic patterns. And this is uh, done here using Markov jump expectations. So basically the transitions that we map using stochastic mapping in the posterior trees. And they are visualized in two different ways. So on the left here, we have Sankey plots that basically show all the transitions from and to a particular location. And the same is shown here uh, on the right in the circular migration plots. Now in these plots, transitions from a particular location like Hubei start close to the outer ring, but they end somewhat more remote uh, to the outer ring for the destination location. So that's how we can distinguish the directionality of the transitions in these circular plots. So if we compare this uh, using sampling time and the travel aware reconstructions, we see that for the travel aware uh, history, uh, we have a more dominant flow out of Hubei here uh, and not from Guangdong. And actually um, Guangdong itself uh, received viruses from travelers returning from Wuhan. So if we in incorporate that information, um, the, the, most of the transitions come now from Hubei. And there's also a switch from the Netherlands to Italy as a secondary transmission center, which is basically what we've seen 
in that B lineage, B1 lineage that I um, that I put up just before. If we incorporate unsampled uh, taxa, again, this basically reinforces uh, our reconstructions. It does not change much, uh, except for a few details. For example, it removes a unexpected transition from the Netherlands to Taiwan in this case. But otherwise, it remains fairly uh, consistent with the travel history reconstruction. And finally, uh, we also looked at an updated data set uh, at the revision stage of our manuscript. So about four months since we originally downloaded uh, the data available on March 10. And then at that time, of course, there was much more data available. And this allowed us to remove sampling bias to some extent by downsampling. Uh, but we still had to include travel history for locations such as Iran. Now, reassuring, reassuringly, the, the reconstruction here uh, using this um, more balanced data set is, uh, again, very similar to the one uh, based on the early data set that includes travel history. OK, um, let me end with an application of this. Uh, that focuses on the early introductions of SARS-CoV-2 in, in US and in Europe. And I'll restrict myself here to the US case, uh, but the European case was, was actually quite similar. So the first um, confirmed case in US is referred to as WA1. Uh, this was a traveler uh, returning to Washington State from Wuhan on January 15. And it was a person who was essentially aware of the COVID problem. So as soon as he developed symptoms, he sought help. And contact tracing didn't identify any spread of this particular virus anymore. So apparently transmission um, uh, appeared to be uh, contained. However, uh, six weeks later, the Seattle flu study um, a large-scale community viral sampling program showed that there were more cases in Washington, like the WA2 here, which is actually from the same county. And all these genomes were genetically similar to the WA, the original WA1 virus. So this seemed to suggest um, a fairly long period of undetected transmission. However, uh, an alternative hypothesis is that the WA outbreak was actually seeded by a separate introduction. And this is an issue that we started to discuss with Mike Warby. Uh, Mike was actually convinced that initially that, they're, that they were indeed epidemiologically linked. But then we gradually started questioning this scenario. And there's arguments that you can put up in favor um, or, or against both explanations. For example, this particular variant seems to be quite um, rare in China, but what has been sequenced from China um, is probably only a fraction of what circulated there. So we decided to have a look at this um, by using a, a, two, uh, a two-fold approach, basically using simulation as well as inference. So we first used a framework to simulate uh, transmission networks and then viral evolution over these transmission, transmission networks using Fabites. And this was work done by Joel Wertheim here and Jonathan Peckar from, uh, from UCSD. And we basically used this to compare the observed evolutionary patterns here where WA1 um, has two substitutions difference from the genomes in the WA outbreak to the ones that we expect to see if WA1 were, was really at the source of this outbreak. So we basically ran the model 1,000 times, each time comparing the genetic sequences of 300 randomly selected cases to those retrieved from the, the 300 actual patients. And uh, 
in all these simulations, the, the patterns appear to be quite different from the ones that we observed from the real data. So quite frequently, we expect to see intermediates here or intermediates that acquired additional substitutions or poly polytomy lineages, or we even expect to see um, a genome identical to WA1 in a large amount of the simulations. So again, these patterns um, were actually quite different from what we observed in the first sample of 300 genomes from this outbreak. However, uh, when more genomes became available, we did see quite a few of these intermediates. So genomes that had a C at position 17747. So this is in line with the simulated patterns. And in, in particular, in, in British Columbia, in Canada, we saw 16 out of the 20 WA outbreak related genomes to have this intermediate state. So that was kind of puzzling to us because it could mean a number of things. For example, it could be that BC was the, the original site of introduction, but that would be implausible because the outbreak was much larger in Washington state as compared to BC. Um, it could have been that there were two separate introductions, one in BC and one in Washington state, uh, but then both would have evolved uh, the derived state at this position, which is also quite implausible if they would have evolved it independently. So we basically ran with uh, a third hypothesis that there were sequences, sequencing errors at play in this case. So in this case, um, these should actually have the derived uh, T mutation at this position but they were incorrectly called as C. And we investigate this um, basically by looking at derived mutations at other positions uh, that share these mutations with other locally sampled genomes with T at this position. For example, um, for four of these, for one of these um, BC genomes, we see four derived mutations that you also see in a BC genome that has the derived T state. So this is highly implausible to explain by homoplasy. It's already very implausible to expect uh, one shared derived mutation by homoplasy. To have four of those by homoplasy um, uh, seems impossible. So that's why we think that most of these, and this is actually the case also for uh, some of these for all of these other intermediate variants from other locations. So that's why we think there's some systematic sequencing error at play here. And in fact, for most of these genomes, um, they were generated by an amplicon protocol that has a primer sequence that contains the C at this position. So we think that it was incorrectly called as a C for all of these genomes. We also performed uh, the spatial temporal reconstruction using the Bayesian approach that I just uh, outlined. And here I'm focusing on the WA outbreak and its closest relatives uh, here. Here's the WA1 genome, which is embedded with Chinese uh, isolates. And when we average over all plausible trees, um, we find strong evidence that the WA outbreak was seeded by an independent uh, introduction from China, uh, probably Hubei, but it could have also been from another Chinese location as, as suggested by district. So essentially both lines of uh, evidence uh, seem to point out separate introduction in this case. Um, which indicates that early containment could have worked and there was and basically an extended period of missed opportunity when intensive testing and contact tracing, tracing could have prevented the establishment of the virus. And that was case, I think, both in US and Europe, which I haven't really discussed, but the B1 lineage that I pointed out earlier 
is actually the, the, the European case. We could not have looked into this without uh, the Seattle flu study, which is a fantastic surveillance architecture uh, that was really crucial for the early insights. Um, so this could be a, a, a real important model for, for early surveillance. And as a final point here, a conclusion, um, because of the low diversity, we can actually um, get information from one or two substitutions to do hypothesis testing. But of course, uh, we need to be cautious about sequencing errors, as I've shown for the, the, BC, the BC genomes um, in, in the previous slide. OK, this is where I will end it. Uh, maybe some, some future perspectives. So the methods that I uh, presented here um, impose some additional scalability issues uh, for the BEAST analysis. And for those that are familiar with BEAST, um, they know that it already takes quite some time to analyze a reasonable size data set. So it's not exactly a real-time tool like Nextring. Uh, but we are making some small steps in that direction. For example, some work led uh, by Mandave Gill and Guy Baller uh, led to the development of an online beast version, um, which is basically a procedure that allows you to interrupt an ongoing MCMC analysis uh, and to add new sequences using a simple distance-based approach, and then resume uh, that particular analysis with the updated data and uh, with the same parameters of the, the final state of the previous run or with updated parameters. So that essentially takes away uh, the burn-in of uh, the beast analysis. Of course, we still need to try to get a good sample from the posterior post burden, uh, and we need to try to do this in an efficient manner. So for that, we need uh, sort of better sampling techniques. And in this respect, it's interesting to point out uh, the, the work on Hamiltonian Monte Carlo uh, that uh, the Sushard group and Xiang Yi has been doing uh, they've been applying it to different parameters in, in this sort of full probabilistic beast framework, such as the, the branch specific rates under an Alex molecular clock, uh, node heights, population sizes, and non uh, parametric coalescent models, um, and also the diffusion rates, for example, in, in these, these, these discrete um, uh, phylogeographic models. So, all of this really um, proves useful and brings us a step closer to, to more efficient inference, hopefully um, also at some point more as a, uh, as a real-time uh, tool. So with this, I would like to uh, thank my team, um, the BEAST developers that I already pointed out, and, and the collaborators. Um, and it actually features also uh, the next speaker in this uh, follow seminar uh, series. Also, thanks to funders and, of course, to uh, everyone out there uh, listening in. Thank you. And I'm also happy to take questions, of course. Thank you very much, Philippe. Yes, yeah, so if you have questions, please type them into YouTube or tweet at Fellow Seminar, and I will read them off. Uh, awesome body of work. Um, there just does seem to be so many interesting and challenging things. Um, I guess it was interesting to see the simulation-based framework play such a key role in that last part of your talk. Um, there's, I mean, actually in discussion with Trevor, I, we were talking about how this is not just like strict beast, right? Eventually, you also have this inferential setup as well. But do you have any reflections on how we might integrate this simulation framework and more traditional beast analysis into something that would allow us to sort of do this more automatically? Huh? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Interesting question. I haven't thought about this. So yeah, indeed, this this the simulation aspect of the study is kind of. Uh, divorced from the, the beast inference uh, because we're simply we're basically looking at very simple patterns produced uh, from the data yeah suppose that we we would do simulations that um, result 
result in far more involved patterns. Uh, and we would introduce also, you know, more locations uh, and so on. I guess these could be connected with beast inference. So we, we, we could try to see if we could actually we could actually try to reconstruct some of the some of the transmission chain dynamics that are being you know that are being uh, simulated rather than the actual than the resulting uh, genetic patterns. So I think that would be an interesting way forward if we if you want to connect it to beast. Uh, so Trevor has a question, uh, in terms of unsampled taxa correction, how do you decide how many taxa from regions with poor reporting to include during this time, China was catching more cases than Iran? Yeah. So yeah, good question. Uh, we don't have any, any, any formal way of doing this. Um, like I said, we, we look at the ratio of genomes over, um, case counts, um, and even case counts can can be biased, of course. Um, and we and then we say, you know, we we want this lower boundary. Um, I think in, in our case it was zero point zero zero five or something. And then we basically augment those locations that fall beneath this boundary. So what, things that we need to kind of explore is, you know, how how many of do these unsampled taxa we really need to get a sense of how they influence the, the reconstructions. Um, we cannot really inflate this too much. Um, in, in this small data set already, like I said, we already have to, um, with this criterion, we already have to introduce twice the amount of unsampled taxa. And integrating out their um, phylogenetic position requires uh, extensive sampling. Um, so yeah, I, I guess we need to try to keep this to a minimum, but we don't know what the minimum is. So this is really uh, things that we need to further investigate. Yeah, I mean, I know it's also pretty, it's pretty challenging to, to understand the, what, what, because you're actually drawing not just sort of like some hidden diversity, you're drawing like actual, this is, how how long it took to sample those sequences? What are their phylogenetic structure of these missing sequences? I know that that takes you into all sorts of complicated math. Do you, do you have any comments about how that all works? Um, yeah, there, there's a couple of things that basically determine um, the phylogenetic position of these taxa. Um, First of all, yeah, the sampling time will kind of determine where it will fall in on the time scale of the tree, of course. Uh, then it's location. Uh, unsampled taxa with a particular location will mostly prefer to cluster with uh, sampled or unsampled taxa from that same location. If it's all, if it attaches to sequences from another location, it will preferably do so uh, to do to those that for which there are high transition rates between that pair, and this is where uh, the the air travel data comes in. So I think it's important to to basically parameterize the the discrete diffusion dynamics using that that type of information, and then also the coalescent uh, dynamics will determine how long the branch can be of the of that particular. Um, unsampled taxa. So there's a number of issues that, or a number of kind of pieces of information that determine where these things fall. Cool, thank you. Uh, just continuing, everybody's curious about the unsampled taxa. Uh, Tiago Graf asks, how computationally demanding is this integration of unsampled taxa? So do the sequences filled with then have the same weight as normal sequences in the beast inference? Um, yes, at this point, um, they, they do have the same weight. Um, I mean, it's, it, the, the, let's say the computation for the sum of these unsampled and, uh, and sampled taxa is not bigger than for the same set of sampled taxa. But 
it does require longer runs be, to basically integrate out all the possible uh, positions of these unsampled taxa. So as I said, they're quite volatile. So you need to do some effort to integrate out their their position in the in the tree. So I think it basically requires, let's say, two to three times longer run times than you would uh, need with uh, all of the data being sampled. Um, there are some things that, that we can do in this respect. Um, we essentially really only need to compute the likelihood, the sequence likelihood for the sample taxa. So this is some things that I think JT is thinking about doing for some of his uh, analysis, um, where you basic, where you only try, try to, where you only identify the subtree uh, with the the actual genomes and compute the likelihood, uh, the sequence likelihood for that, and you only compute the full tree likelihood for the discrete trait uh, likelihood. So that could probably help speeding up things. Cool. All right, Anna Zhukova has a question, which is, I wonder when you incorporate the ancestral nodes of the travel history, how can you be sure that at the moment of travel, the person was already infected? Huh, yeah, um, it's an assumption that we make, right? We assume um, that, these person, that these persons actually acquired their infection um, from at the location of travel. And this, we, I think for most of the cases, we can safely make that assumption because many of them have been sampled uh, within, basically within days after returning uh, from their travel. It becomes more tricky if you would have to decide about uh, genome sampled from patients, let's say 10 days after they return from a particular travel location. Um, so, yeah, in that sense, um, like I said, we need to assume that they were infected there. Um, you can also introduce ambiguous locations for these um, for these ancestral nodes if you're not entirely sure. So that might be um, a way forward in that case. Cool. Um, I think this might have come up in the previous talk, but what about evidence for the presence of recombination between different strains uh, in the current circulating SARS-CoV-2 variants? Yeah, so yeah, I remember also this this came up. Um, I think what we have seen in some of the data is uh, homoplasies, and I've pointed out some homoplasies as well. Um, and in this case, and I think for many of the other cases as well, they basically can be attributed to sequencing error. Um, so I don't think we we have seen any genuine uh, recombinance as yet, which would of course require co-infection of uh, variants that are um, quite or well, relatively divergent to be able to pick up. Um, Trevor, just as a follow-up to the to my first question, which is, could these simulation frames give you a prior and beast? Or, I mean, I guess I, just to add to that, I mean, um, yeah, so could we fit it into some sort of formal hypothesis testing framework or something like that? Yeah, that's an, yeah, it's an interesting suggestion. Um, yeah, we'd have to think about it a bit. Um, maybe also for the kind of the more um, structured coalescent models um, or the SIR implementation of these models, models that could be um, a way of, of providing a, a, a prior distribution to some of the parameters of these models. Um, I'm not sure at this point how you know how to connect it through prior specification, but yeah, I, I think it's an interesting suggestion to look at. The sequencing error is just sort of like a, a bit of a scary story, right? Um, and I mean, the fact that you could trace it back to the primers is really interesting and helpful. Um, I mean, I think that there has been sort of a low-lying theme of incorporating sequencing error in phylogenetic analyses. It hasn't been widely deployed as far as I know. But here, it's not just that we're looking at sequencing error as sort of a general thing. There's a very non-uniform likelihood of sequencing error because these primers are so 
I mean, on a practical level, what, like, what are we going to do moving forward if we're just sort of rerun things? Mm. What's what's the strategy there? I mean, can you? Yeah, I, sequences are key. So yeah, I, some of these things again you can identify using homopathy. So you could you could do some filtering uh, for genomes that have evidence for homopathy. Um, I'm I'm not familiar with the methods of incorporating sequencing error, uh, but maybe they could be tuned to incorporate sort of more systematic uh, sequencing error where you kind of as assign a high likelihood for a sequencing error in primer sequences, for example. Um, so maybe that's uh, something to look at. Yeah, I don't think that would be too, too hard, at least, you know, mathematically. I guess the thing that would seem hard to me would be how do we sort of look at a sequencing protocol and be able to make an estimate of like what the per base pro uh, mistake probability is. And maybe it's not too hard. Maybe you could just run a bunch of the identical sequence with the with the sequencing protocol and see what happens, but that's extra work, et cetera, et cetera. And stuff. Yeah, and it's it's confounded by the fact that you have many different sequencing protocols as well. So. Yes, yeah, and that's, so that's an additional complication when you're sort of aggregating data from lots of studies, but that's the key. Um, any final thoughts about future directions that you feel like you know the field needs to go in order to be ready for SARS-CoV-3? <laughs> uh, no, I think we, we, we need better early surveillance. Um, uh, basically, across the world, we, we in it would be nice to have early surveillance in, in China. Um, there's still this kind of uncertainty when the virus entered the human population. Um, we're seeing all these messages from uh, sewage water identification in, in Europe. So uh, we're a bit in the in the dark in terms of um, kind of what the, the early epidemiology was. I think the case for early surveillance has really been made by the, the Seattle flu study uh, where you where you can really pick up um, kind of the early evolutionary dynamics the epidemic dynamics so I think that should be a model for for early early surveillance so I hope um, this can be kind of a, taken as an example across the world awesome well, I think that's it for questions. Uh, we've already taken you a little bit over time. Uh, thank you very much, Philippe. And right, we'll be back in a little while with JT Macro. Great. Thanks for uh, having me and uh, thanks for organizing these, uh, Eric. Yeah, thanks for uh, participating twice. <laughs> yeah. Take care.